Okay, so we're going to review anatomy and physiology of the ear. I know you've had anatomy. Uh, we'll cover anatomy of the ear specifically a little later uh, in this semester, but I want to review some of the more general topics now that um, might come up in the interim. So um, we have the external ear. Primary uh, responsibilities are to um, collect sound and protect the ear. Okay, those are the, the, the two primary responsibilities. Um, of course, the pinna is the large cartilaginous structure on the side of the head, which varies substantially uh, by individual. It has uh, important functions for localization and collecting sound. So the ear canal, or the external auditory meatus, um, is S-shaped. Um, so when you do an otoscopic inspection and you look in there, sometimes you have to pull the ear up and back a little bit to be able to see straight back to the ear canal. And they think that's a, a protective function. Um, so nothing can pierce the eardrum through the ear because it has bends in it, essentially. And it also acts as an acoustic resonator um, and amplifies... Uh, higher frequency sounds. Now we're not going to spend a bunch of time going over this. Uh, went over it in my other class if you happen to be in that class. But basically what the external ear does is it amplifies sound, kind of resonates naturally, just like the vocal tract has natural resonant properties. It naturally resonates somewhere between mm, two, three and four thousand hertz. Okay. Um, and that is basically where the speech signal starts to decline in intensity, right? We looked at the long-term average speech spectrum. After a thousand hertz, it starts to decline in intensity. Well, that's where the ear naturally enhances it. The middle ear, this is the mechanical portion, um, tympanic membrane, ossicle, eustachian tube, and muscles in the ear. Here are some landmarks. Again, we're not going to spend a bunch of time on this, but we will later. But the middle ear starts at the eardrum. There you can see right here different uh, landmarks. Oops. Conolite is essentially a reflection off of the bony portion of the cochlea. And when you can see the cone of light, uh, it's often an indicator that there's no middle ear fluid or effusion in there. You can see some of the bones behind there in the middle ear, a tendon there. Okay. Again, we'll do more of this later. But the, the primary um, function, the important function of the middle ear space is to act as an impedance matching transformer. And it's held in place by these uh, um, um, uh, tendons and, and joints. Uh, and so, again, we'll do more of that. But the important information right now is that it acts as an impedance matching transformer. It is aerated by the eustachian tube. And of course, the eustachian tube Sometimes it'll be referred to as the auditory tube, but it essentially allows for a, um, a consistent air pressure in the middle ear space. So many of you have probably been on an airplane or gone up in the mountain. You feel your ears start to get tight, and then you move your jaw, you open your mouth, something like that, and then you feel it pop, if you will. That's your station tube kind of equalizing that pressure, Okay. And again, the middle ear transformer is the important, very com important component of the middle ear system. So if you think about um, a transmission medium like air versus water, right? Water has uh, substantially more impedance, okay? Right, and you've, you've been in a pool, you've gone underwater, people have tried to talk to you, you can't hear them, right? If there was no water there, you'd hear them fine, right? So the, the acoustic... Um, output from the vocal fold, from the vocal tract, um, the air molecules cannot penetrate that water. It's too dense, right? There's too much impedance, right? So uh, the middle ear does that for the auditory system. So when you're listening to um, sounds in the environment, there's an air molecule um, um, disturbance, right? And without the middle ear space, that that disturbance cannot penetrate the cochlea, the fluid-filled cochlea. So the middle ear basically creates this, this it, it fixes this mis mismatch that occurs. And we call that the middle ear transformer. And again, we'll get more into that uh, later. So the cochlea is the inner ear. This is where the sensory um, uh, processing occurs 
I always say this is where the magic happens. Um, this is where you start to get uh, very sophisticated processing in the cochlea, okay, in the inner ear. And of course, it has the three the three um, portions, okay. They're all part of the membranous cochlea, meaning that this is these are all membranes. This is soft, okay. It's not the bony portion. You have the scala media, scala vestibuli, and scala tympani. The scala media is where the organ of corti and all of the very fine sensory structures reside, okay. The basilar membrane is tonotopically organized. If you do uh, remember that concept, basically there are certain portions of the basilar membrane that are sensitive and responsive to certain frequencies. Base has a very short, uh, has a very narrow, very tight um, uh, anatomical uh, makeup. And so the base vibrates uh, differentially for high frequencies and then the apex as you go up the basilar membrane. Uh, vibrates for low frequencies and again this is another topic that we'll cover more in detail but just as a review for now here's the organ of corti right here you have three rows of outer hair cells one row of inner hair cells okay you have fluid which is endolymph um, and a bunch of other structures which we'll get uh, into more later um, but just a reminder this is the sensory um, area of the cochlea. Now, the primary difference between outer and inner hair cells, for right now, what I want you to remember is that the outer hair cells are a very active and mechanical system, meaning that they contract and elongate to make the ear sensitive to low level sounds. Okay, that's what the outer hair cells do. The inner hair cells send most of the neural input from the cochlea to the brain. Okay, so the outer hair cells make the ear very sensitive. We hear better because of our outer hair cells, but we hear speech and other complex um, inputs, sounds, because of our inner hair cells. Okay, so you can kind of think of the, I always use the example, the uh, outer hair cells are like the linemen on a football team, right? They do all the hard work. They're doing all the pushing. They're protecting the quarterback, right, and running back, okay? So they do all the, the, the gritty stuff. And then the uh, quarterback and the running back, they do all the gl uh, the glorious stuff, right? They get they get all the attention, right? They're, they're scoring the touchdowns, right? So they're more like the inner hair cells. They do that very important kind of um, – uh, finite type processing, right? The, the quarterback throws passes and uh, running back finds the hole in the, you know, that the lineman created, right? So that's, that's the example I always use. And I'm sorry to use a football analogy um, <laughs> if it doesn't make sense to you. But um, so inner hair cells, very important for understanding speech. Outer hair cells, very important for, uh, for, sensitivity. The ear is very sensitive because of them. We also, <clears throat> excuse me, we also have some balance uh, mechanisms or structures within the um, inner ear. Here we have the cochlear portion. Here we have the vestibular portion, which has three what we call semicircular canals. Those basically, when you move your head in space, kind of lean your head forward or back, there's fluid and crystals in those that shift around to say, okay, now my head's facing downward. Now I'm, you know, lying down, right? And now I'm facing the ceiling. So that's what those do. Heavily involved in balance control. Now, the vestibular cochlear nerve or the auditory nerve, okay, there's a balance portion of it, and then there's a an auditory portion of the eighth cranial nerve. I'm sure you talked about this a lot um in under in uh, your anatomy class uh this is part um still part of the peripheral set, uh, uh nervous system um after the auditory nerve we start to consider all those structures part of the central auditory nervous system so this is like the last part of what we call the peripheral uh, auditory nervous system and it's tonotopically organized just like the um the basilar membrane, so low frequency fibers are at the apex and at the base you have high frequency fibers. 
same as the um, uh, basal membrane. And there you can see uh, here you have inside of the, I'm sorry, I, <laughs> but those um, fibers that come from the base uh, go to the um, outside of the auditory nerve because it's a high frequency fiber and you can see that represented there. And then the low frequencies are on the inside of the auditory nerve. So that, that tonotopic organization that was present and the cochlea is preserved at the auditory nerve. And here's a visual that really helps you. So these type 1 fibers that are coursing off the inner hair cells go straight to the brain. Like they are the fibers that provide the brain with the information about speech and other complex signals. And you can see there's a ton of them coursing off the inner hair cells, but not any off the outer hair cells. Okay. So this visual basically shows you why inner hair cells um, are so important for understanding speech. Another concept, another uh, function of the eighth cranial nerve is what we call phase locking. Okay, so if you uh, think back to when we talked about phase of a signal, right, and we looked at a sine wave, and you could see there was certain points where it would be where the sound is in time, right? Um, the auditory nerve basically fires to keep track and to provide the brain with information about um, what we call periodicity, right? So if you remember, um, like pure tones, for example, are perfectly periodic. And if you were to play a pure tone and the auditory nerve was to fire, it would fire at certain points over time consistently. And that is what we call phase locking. That's an extremely important function of the auditory nerve, the eighth cranial nerve. And it gives us information about the frequency of the sound and, and, and information like that. So we'll get more into this later on as well, but this is just a quick, quick overview in case some of these concepts arise before we get to the anatomy and physiology chapters.